Hi there YouTube, Ms. Lowbearer here. We're on the ground at the Garissa mine site. We have a uh, private aircraft here, which is pretty unusual for the Garissa. <laughs> we'll be flying it over to Carnarvon today, which is not unusual. Just uh, having a look at our flight plan, I've just uh, decided to put in an extra stop. Well, not a real stop, or flying over the top. But, here is our flight planning for today. We'll be uh, taking off out of the Degrassa mine. We're flying up here to uh, pass over these river channels. They probably won't have water in them at the moment, but uh, that's fairly standard. The first one here is our Dolgana, or the X Dolgana. Um, that's a old pastoral lease that used to do sheep. Uh, it says ex Dulgana because it's uh, run by Aborigines now. It's no longer a white man's pasture. After passing through Dulgana, or the creek next to Dulgana, we'll uh, pass through this little river here. I've marked where that road is. That road moves up to this Horseshoe Lights Mine, which is fairly obvious right here. We'll tag that as a point. Another random spot here between these two channels. You can see one channel system over there, one channel system behind you, and the crossover point between the two systems. And finally, we come up to this road right here, the Landor Mikathara Road, before we hit this extra road on this side. Now, somewhere around here, before we hit the Gascoigne River, we're going to turn northbound. Uh, this is, in fact, a little airport here, Landor Station, it's an airport, to dirt strip. Not even sure it has a windsock, it's just a dirt strip. Anyway, at Landor, we're going to turn northbound, and we're going to head up towards Mount Augusta, is what uh, the white people would call it. Mount Augustus National Park. The Aborigines call this place Beringara. Now this big thing here is a rock. It is a rock every bit much like Ayers Rock. As you can see it's a rather darker in colour. Kind of this blackish, very dark grey colour. Um, sitting in the middle of this kind of desert plateau. It is a rock. A single individual mass monolith rock kind of thing. Exactly the same structure as Uluru, Ayers Rock. Anyway, we'll fly around that for a bit. And after we've found that, made sure we've spotted it, we'll head on down towards uh, our final destination at um, Carnarvon. Now, Carnarvon is a small, uh, well, it's not that small actually. It's a port city. It's uh, known for several things, including growing bananas, uh, fishing and crabbing and that kind of stuff. Uh, this big ugly brown thing is the Gascoigne River which is probably dry this time of year, it is the dry season, so the river itself probably won't even have any water in it. We'll see a little bit of a, a clip as we come towards there. And there's the airfield. We also have just south of here a NASA um, has built a very large satellite there, so I'll just take a look at that as well, maybe on the way in. So that's uh, our route of flight today. You can see this massive northbound turn Basically, I was uh, planning to do a straight through flight and then I learned about this place up here at Mount, Mount Augusta and I thought if that's going to be the largest single mass rock on the continent, bigger than Uluru, we might as well go and see it. I have prepared, of course, one of these navigation logs. We're going to assume that we'll be doing 225 knots overall. Flight time today is 109 minutes. That doesn't include holding at uh, Barangara, so I'll probably do that for about an extra 10 minutes or so. That'll give us two hours of uh, time from takeoff to touchdown. I'll walk over to the aircrafts and we say hello to Lachlan, Anthony, Aaron, Matt Coles, Jack, Spencer, and Florian. I'm going to 
Let's pop through the gate here. Now we cross over there. Hi oh, there, TK Army. Not doing too bad. Refueling on this airport is by our truck. And having a look at our stuff here. We have Plutonic Mine, which is about 16 miles away to the uh, north northwest. There's us at Degressa. And there's Glavin. The worst uh, position is 4,700 uh, feet, 5,000 feet over there, minimum uh, minimum altitude. We'll be uh, cruising at 6,500 today, so we'll be one and a half thousand above that. Alright, here we are, X-ray Tango Zulu. Time to jump in. Oh, well, the sound of other aircraft just come with the package that we installed. That's the FLAI package. If the aircraft exists, they'll make some noise. If they've just spawned in, they'll make the noise of their engine running at idle. After about five minutes, they'll shut down their engines if they haven't moved. As soon as they move, the engines are going again. Cool, so the flaps are down. We'll do a quick walk around. Yeah, I love the old uh, canopy on the that's uh, they are a little bit annoying to be honest to open and close because they are quite heavy but uh, you know you get a cool bubble canopy at the end of the day all right looking down here we have some flaps making sure that they're all good the other one's happy we have the two wires at the back lights Yep, I'll be doing the Norwegian 7-3. Good idea. Wasn't convinced of it until I was confirmed that there was a real flight that did it two months ago <laughs> on a regular basis. There's the Pito probe. Up the top of the wing we do have a fuel and a speed brake. Up front we have landing lights. And just under the wing, of course, we have a landing gear. Up the front, a three-bladed propeller with some intakes behind it, and a spinner. Just over here a little bit, we'd have an opening right there. That's where the oil goes. You'd open it up, give it a check. From around the other side, we'll uh, check the landing gear as well is happy fuel drain is done and there's nothing there but fuel and the right kind of fuel up the top of the wing again here and here I'll we'll check the landing gear as well light Ailerons, flaps, checking the landing gear from this side as well. To the back of the aircraft, we'll just double check that the trim is uh, moving well, and the uh, elevator and the rudder. There's also a light on the back. 
And with that, it's time to jump back in. Okay, let's plan our next couple of moves, including the weather. So here at De Grasse Mine, it is a wonderful temperature of 26 degrees Celsius. Wind is from the west, 270 at 10. Don't know why, but I don't have the Ursa up. <laughs> and I need it up. So a DGU. Cool. What was that weird airport? I doubt it's in the Ursa. Trying to find the name of this place. Landor. No, not there. Carnarvon is there. Cool. So closing that up. Going to check out Carnarvon or De Grasso. Uh, the AWIS frequency 128.6, but there's no phone number for it. Uh, the Unicom 126.7. And uh, over in Carnarvon, we do have a. There we go. Just checking what that phone number is, though. W A T I R. Interesting. That's something I want to research before we go calling it. Weather and Terminal Information Receiver. Intriguing. Normally we'll get an AWIS. Not a WITIA. Anyhow, De Grossa, we're on the runway 27N, so essentially we're going to taxi onto the runway and just blast off straight ahead. Which is pretty fun. After we do take off, we're going to take up a heading of uh, 274. We're going to fly for six minutes and then we're going to cross uh, that first position, which is uh, the Dolga, Eye of the Creek. Just looking at it on the map. So we should blast off and we should see Creek about six minutes after departure. Current time is 10. We'll uh, log the time when we just advance the power. All right, with all of that planning sorted, and heading over uh, 274 ready to go. We will start her up. Fuel pump's good. That's off. And we'll clear the prop. No one's around. Clear prop! Good start. 1000 RPM. How the lights are in. Yep, 
and we have one of these things so we might as well use it. Um, I was going to consider chucking in, what's that place oh, called, Landor Station, okay. Wild Yo, let's see if it's there. No, not there. Never mind. So here's the deal. We've just got Carnarvon set in. That's 309 nautical miles, almost directly west. We're going to follow that along until we hit this point at uh, Landor. Uh, we'll only know that by the fact that we have been travelling for 6 minutes and 5 minutes and 14 and 11 and 7. Now Landor is a position where there's a crossroads next to the river. So we just need to make sure that we uh, keep track of where we are at all times. What's that? 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8. 9, 10, 11, so 115 nautical miles away from where we are currently, 115 minus 310, it's about 200 and nothing, okay, cool, it's not even that, 190, Put 196. So my uh, turn point northbound is 196 from Carnarvon. I'm going to climb up to uh, 6,500. Perhaps will come up. Gonna check the uh, controls. Uh, it doesn't directly come with the G GPS. Uh, the GPS is its own add-on, which then fits in with this add-on if you run through the thing. Um, it's the Flight One GPS. which is this thing. So Flight 1 uh, GTN product, <laughs> whatever it's called. It used to be called the 750 but it comes with both the 7 and the 650. And you just uh, run the product installer and that should come in. purchase it because it's very similar to the uh, thing that we used on Hotel Tangamai for the real aircraft, especially this second. Okay, we're going to uh, swap into Degressor Mine, there we are. Let's make a broadcast and head on out. Traffic Degressor Mine, X-Ray Tango Zulu is a uh, Lancer Legacy, we're taxiing to runway 27, or call 1 Tetra. Ten flat. Yes, where products have an installer for it as well, so you can easily set it up there. Alright, what I'm going to do is move past the centre line slightly, then point ourselves into the wind, and we'll do some run ups. Brakes are set. Okay, looking for 2000 RPM. It's 
sensitive on that one. 2060, we'll have to do. Left, drops it by about 50 or so. Up to the right, it's about 45 actually. That's cool. Tango Delta Kilo taxiing runway 27 Degrassa. Degrassa traffic, X-ray Tango Zulu is entering runway 27 Degrassa Mine. Uh, departure straight ahead to the west. Pop on some lights. Fuel boost is on for departure. Okay, current time 18, call it 19, because it most of the way through the 18th minute, might even just hold here for a sec. That's one way 27, 19. Well, let's go. Gear up. Laps coming up. Time is 19, 2005. Come on, it's Banana Tango Delta Kilo entering and rolling runway 2748 West of the departure. They've got the mic. 2300 set. Time will be 25 for the first waypoint. So we're going to go at 180 knots. Just looking forward to uh, stabilise that climb out now. <laughs> Indeed. Bit of uh, legwork there required. Leave it ever so slightly lean of peak as you are climbing into it. Gonna arm the altitude. Yeah, give it about what, 800 a minute. Pass for the nav. All parts on.
Yeah, go H one zero one eight. Lancer can get up to, we're talking like 18,000 feet. Struggles up that high, but I think it's more comfortable down about uh, maybe 12 to, 12 to 15,000. Yeah, we'll get up to 18,000 feet quite happily. Today we're just going to take it up to 6,500 since I don't want to be on oxygen. It's a turbo charged aircraft, it's not a turbo prop, so it is um, reciprocating. So it's all piston and stuff. And to be honest, it gets better gas mileage, probably in the 10 to 12,000 foot range. It's about where it tends to be on its prime. No, she's not IBSM approved, of course not. <laughs> she can't get up to 29,000 feet anyway, so there's no point. Oh, this file will be about two hours long. Well, it's going to be about one and a half hours, but then I've added the extra diversion out to uh, Oregara. And that adds about 20 minutes or so to the flight. Yep, that's right. I mean, you can keep on climbing until it stops climbing, <laughs> essentially. Just maintain the same speed at full power and see how high it goes. Same airspeed, that is. So if you peg an airspeed, say, and climbing airspeed at around 140 knots, and just peg it at full power, see how high it goes, um, the non turbocharged version will probably peak out at about 20,000 feet, and the turbocharged version will get you up to the official ceiling is 24,000 but I'm sure it can go higher because the limiting factor is, as you said, the oxygen because it's not a pressurised aircraft, you've got to wear O2 and even at 100% partial pressure on a full gas breathing oxygen mask there's only so much air that you can force into your lungs Yeah, pressure on version would be good, but that would, you know, cost heaps, and the bubble canopy isn't really conducive to being pressurized. It'd have to be a different shape or a different canopy. Or cost a million dollars extra. <laughs> One of those. Something has to give. An extra million dollars, then yeah, sure. I'm just going to actually increase the speed a little. That's not too bad. Let's calibrate our um, O2 here. So I have got a temperature. What's the outside temperature? 11. Oh, that's not too bad. It's nice in air condition. 11 degrees Celsius. Really. And I'm going to put the 6000 on the plus 11. So that's somewhere around there. So at 220 knots, I reckon. <coughs> That's going to increase manifold pressure up to about 23. We're not at full power yet, but we're getting close. So 
So this is calibrated airspeed at uh, temperature and altitude. So the 6 is 6,000 feet, we're actually 6,500 aren't we? It should be that side. And that's 0, that'll be 15, so 11 will be somewhere around there. So it's showing about 224 knots indicated, uh, calibrated. That's airspeed of course. Uh, this is uh, 209 knots of ground speed, but we've got 17 knot headwind. It's actually slowing us down a bit. Just adjust our fuel mixture, push that all the way up to the peak, and then we'll see where that is. Let's get the close. There it is, 86, and we'll add about 5, ooh, all the way up to 87, cool. 1, Eighty-one, eighty-two, somewhere around there. Gives us a little bit of a buffer on the full EGT. That means uh, <coughs> there's a little more fuel left over in the piston after the full um, combustion has occurred. Some of that fuel isn't entirely burned off, and that becomes lubrication for the uh, cylinder to go up and down. So I'm about maybe three or four degrees off peak. That's why I was taught how to lean an engine. I know some people actually uh, go lean of peak, which uh, means that it burns all of the fuel and uh, then some. <laughs> Part of the combustion is slightly weaker than a, a full thing. By leaning it out, we've uh, gained 10 knots. So I'm actually going to reduce our um, power a little bit now. Come back to about 22 on the manifold. Well, down to about there. That's time 29. Which puts our first waypoint behind us. 25 will be 30. So we should be just over that horseshoe mine right about now. There's a road going to it. An external view because I can't see. There's the road. Cool, road is spotted. Time 3 0. So pretty much on course and on time. Now I'm going to add 14 this to uh, west, uh, the west channel. There's a channel that faces a westbound that we follow along, so 14 minutes is uh, 44. So in 14 minutes time we should come across a river channel that goes westbound. All the rest of them are going north to south, that's where the first one that tracks west with us. Just a reminder where we are on Google Earth, we're past this road here. And the next thing that we should see that we've chucked in for nine, no, what was it, 14 minutes, is the westbound channel. channel. This thing here. After that should be another road. slow down a little bit too much, going to pick up that pace a little, not too much manifold pressure, probably another 0.2, 22.2. He's a very slippery beast, the uh, Lancer Legacy, so give it 
ever so slightly more power and she'll just start speeding up. <laughs> we can stay at the same power and tuck in a little bit of rudder so it's side slipping a bit and you can watch that speed all wash away. Uh, here's the posse, we've got someone uh, following us. Uh, DGU Multicom, let's have a look at what frequency we should be on. Uh, this is who we should be monitoring. It'll be one of the Melbourne centres I reckon. So there's Waluna, there's De Grossa. we're heading southbound, we should be with 122.6. But we're on Batsim, so technically we should actually be on 122.8. Uh, you know what, I'm going to put 122.6 in this window and that's actually popped up with the correct uh, frequency number Degrossa Info, how about that? and I think we'll put 122.8 in our secondary radio That's set, that's set, and the panel should have monitoring on both. Sorted. And the green, yellow and red thing, that is a uh, angle of attack indicator. So I think that's, uh, can't be 13 degrees, it's uh, probably uh, 1.3 degrees angle of attack. So in the green is perfectly fine, stable air. And the yellow is getting a bit touchy and by the time you hit the red you're in a stall. But that uh, downward arrow thing is to stall buffet. So if you if it becomes black all the way up to here, then you'll start getting some stall buffet. Uh, if it gets black all the way up to the point where that black little circle is there, you'll start getting the stall warning horn. Got a phone call coming in, be a second. Back. So yeah, that's the angle, angle of attack indicator. In the green means you're good. In the yellow means you're getting close to the buffet. In the black means that the store warning horn is making noises. And in that, uh, those two yellow chevrons show that you're actually getting stall buffet. And then once you hit the red, you are in a stall. Yeah, just the bars go black as you uh, increase. So if I was to increase angle of attack, uh, let's take the other part of that and risk this. <laughs> if I pulled up pretty sharp, you can see they start to disappear. Like that. So the little black dot is just a stall warning horn. Once the black once the black bars retreat up to the black dot, you get the meet, 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 stall, stall. Because these aircraft can be used in the utility category and you can pull up to like 4G on these things. So you can put them up to, you know, some light aerobatics. Speaking of which, fuel boost pump from yellow. Yeah, the black dot is a little bit confusing, but essentially it is just where the stall warning horn starts.
got a G meter over here, which I should probably push back to standard, but there's 0G, there's a 1G, there's 2G. And as you can see, we can push it all the way up to 8 <laughs> or negative 4. Probably break the wings off it if you went up to, to 8. But anyway. Uh, those little things showing 2 degrees and uh, 2G and 0G, you can just reset that. But any turbulence will kind of increase that uh, position there. So at some point in the past we've uh, flown a 2G turn and gone to 0. But yeah, it can quite easily pull a 4G. And I think it's rated up to 6, but... I don't know what you'd have to do to make it get all the way to six. Probably when we land now, it's going to open up that G accelerator accelerometer again, all the way up to about one and a half. That there was, of course, the good old ADF and DB wet compass up there. Not much else on this thing that's particularly interesting. We have the yellow one trim and rudder trim there. Elevator trim here. Flaps there. That there's a parking brake. Turn corner, VOR. What's really slightly annoying is the VOR's over here, but the DME is all the way over here. Or you just put the DME in, in your GPS and call it GPS. Now time, 40. So four minutes until we cross. Now Welsh. Forty-four to eleven. Fifty-one. Uh, what are they? Five. Fifty-five. Okay. When's our turn point? Not there. Cool. Yeah, for the moment we're looking at 44, three minutes away. Hi there, Aaron. How you doing? Oh yeah, that's right, this aircraft also has uh, big chunky speed brakes on it, so you can do the whole slowing down while descending. We're running a little slow, about five knots slow on this leg. Let's see what it does. I'll just do uh, the old 220. Yeah, it's not too bad. Extra minute. Okay. We can live with that. Two oh six. 
Yeah, that's more like it. We're doing 220. We'll leave it on that. We'll just put that all the way through. Time is 42. We've got two minutes out. Cut the channel right there. The difficult thing about this landscape is we're in the dry season, so all the rivers and channels are dry. So you can't really easily tell where they are. <laughs> so that's essentially a channel right there. But how could you tell? It's just like this, this stain of dried mud on the already dried dirt next to it. I guess you can see some of the salt that's uh, formed into it. But I reckon that's our channel right up there. One minute away, so we will be crossing that channel in a in a minute. That's not a lake, that's just a shadow from that cloud. <laughs> very hard to see, big river, very easy to see, shadow from the cloud. Yeah, good stuff it's right. And how that's time 44, that's the channel. At some point in December, January, there was water there. Alrighty, next one up is at time 55, uh, Leonard Road. And at time 02, past the hour, make our big northbound turn. We're going to head essentially directly north. Time out too. Okay, Google. Set an alarm for seven oh two PM. Built sixteen minutes out from now. so I don't forget in case we get talking and then I don't want to blast past our uh, turn point it's a pretty sharp turn it's almost a 9 degree off how many degrees is it? Uh, we're heading at uh, 2, 1 no we're not heading 274 yeah it's essentially just under uh, 354 because we do have a, a a whistling wind. So I have to do it there. Good, good to know. Let's confirm our wet compass, we're on a westerly. And there's a westerly right there. <laughs> so uh, D Goodman now has an alarm set for 7:02 p.m. Good start.
So here is the plan, uh, we continue along to this uh, waypoint, uh, what's it called again, Lanor. And once we reach Lanor, we track northbound towards uh, this little rock, the largest rock in Australia. Bigger than Ayers Rock. So the next major thing is we pass a road that's parallel to a little channel, probably dry. The road should be fairly obvious. At time 55. And just a couple of minutes after that, seven minutes, we should pick up a road running over a channel that points into the Gascoigne River, which is probably going to be dry. And then we uh, head northbound. I'll just do it off the time. So far the time's doing pretty good. Yeah, right on the 220 and 207. It reckons 206. We're going to extend uh, this wind to 290 at 14. Up to here, because we're still at 207 knots. According to the forecast, we should have the wind increasing in velocity and moving slightly to the south. Not much to the south, but a little bit. Oh, to the north, I mean. <laughs> 290 at 14. At the moment, we're still this two, uh, two weights here at 11. Also, showing one degree less than forecast said 12 degrees at 11. 10 now. Okay. Five minutes out to the first road. The road is cutting through about northwest from the uh, from the from southeast to northwest. I always get my east and west mixed up when I'm flying in West Australia. I'm flying towards the coastline and I'm thinking, the coast is in the east, but I know I'm flying west. There's <laughs> just like a little moment. I'm going, east, west, west, east? Yeah, okay. Two conflicting ideas in my head. We're flying westbound and we're flying towards the coastline. <laughs> My eastern uh, state's brain just doesn't like that. Very much so. People are very backwards in West Australia. Three minutes out from the road. I'll pick up visual scanning in a minute or two. Uh, the road is essentially just um, a check that our speed is about right. At the moment we're still on autopilot on the direct line and we know where we are. We know where we are on the line, but as far as time tracking is concerned, we just need to make sure that we're uh, keeping pace. 
13. That speed's picking up. Ah, uh, back to 225. Okay. <laughs> we magically uh, just gained 5 knots. Don't know where it came from. So better start uh, visually scanning for this road now, because we might be early. By a minute or two. Give us only five knots over a period of about a minute. Probably only going to be a few seconds early, but. Actually, increasing speed after I've reduced the power. <laughs> what? Road is spotted. It's time, 54. We're about a minute early, maybe? Not over the road yet. Once we pass the road directly, then that'll be time. So we might still have 30 seconds in there. But yeah, you've got to spot these roads. They're dirt road on dirt. It's a bit hard to see. But they're not invisible. I have a feeling that we're about 30 seconds early. Pass directly over the top. That's when ah, it's 55 now, so I reckon we're on time. I'd pull that overhead right now. Cool. So we passed over at 55. We estimated it would be 55. Yeah, it was at 55. The next one will be 02. Speed to 10. You know, starting to run into the headwind now. 16 knots on the head. So I'm going to stick with that 280 at 21. Might be a bit much, but you know. So far, the timings have worked out pretty well. So we're all good for the alarm. When the alarm goes off, we all hit the old um, heading mode. As you can see, we're ever so slightly west of north, so we can just keep track of an even altitude like we are. No need to climb or descend. So right over there we can see a little dark patch with some water puddles in it. That is the Gascoigne River. Uh, apart from mostly being dry, which it is, um, which is rather embar embarrassing for the, uh, the Western Australian, but the Gascoigne River, which is dry right now, um, is the longest river in Western Australia. Uh, some locals call it the Upside Down River because the, the bottom of the river is at the top because it's dry and all the water is underneath the ground and about maybe three to four months a year it'll flood and we've got a whole bunch of water going down it then over the next 
couple of months it'll just subside into nothing to a couple of dry <laughs> sandy riverbanks and that's that's the longest river in a western Australia. not even a river in more than half a year a kind of moist area with trees near it Bring manifold pressure back up to 200 and again 22. There it is. Yeah, it's probably a little bit much. Bring it back a point or two. Okay, four minutes out from our turn point. Gasquoy River should come back towards us. So it's uh, flowing a little bit. Oh, yeah, there's the turn. So when I say flowing, I mean <laughs> there's no water to flow. How embarrassing would it be that the longest river in the state doesn't even have water in it most of the time? There it is, a little patch of blue. The river, right here. There's the river. A kind of dark patch in the ground. Where some stuff sometimes grows. Two minutes out. About thirty seconds out. road up here. There it is, road spotted. There it is right there. So pretty much as we pass over the road we won't be turning. In fact I'm going to go early. Let's do it now. Alarm. There's the road. That road that was uh, off our left side coming up is a meeting right about where we're turning, which is perfect. So if we just stick to this heading, and I'll just double check the wind. Now we're getting 16 knots of wind. Uh, Instead of 21, so we're August, 16 knots instead of that. Yeah, I don't think it's 290, it's more south or southerly than that, isn't it? It's west. Uh, 270, 260, I reckon. That's 270 there. Uh, 270, we'll call it. Going to get a ground speed of 219 and a heading of 355. So put that extra bit in there. 222. Juice speed by two knots. And we'll be right on the money.
And how long do we need to go? 16 minutes past the 2, 16, 17, 18, it'll be 18 minutes past the hour. And we'll be at Augusta, Mount Augustus, or Burringurra, depending on if you're an English speaker or a Kiri Aboriginal speaker. What language did they actually speak here? It probably wasn't Kiri, it's a Sydney based language. As I said, I didn't know about this place until I was doing the flight plan. I noticed that this place was just north of here, so I said, why not visit it? Um, it is apparently the largest single rock in Australia, which is essentially what Ayers Rock is. There's a photo of it on uh, Wikipedia. Looks like that. So flat, 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 big hill. It's not actually a hill, it's a single rock. a monolith. So if you can imagine soil just sitting flat and this big chunky rocks kind of just stuck in the soil. Solid rock, granite. Probably volcanic in origin at some point in the past. And Inselberg or monocline. Uh, the rock is 8 kilometers end to end in diameter. So this rock was discovered in 1858. And it's a national park now. So unlike uh, Uluru Ayers Rock, which is famous and actually owned by Aborigine uh, Council, this is a national park, which means it's uh, Australian crown land. And the local Aborigines don't really have much of a say, but they're okay with climbing. <laughs> so if you want to climb a big rock, come to this one. Because you're not allowed to climb Uluru anymore. Run ourselves 18 minutes past, about um, one third of the way there. Currently at time six. Let's monitor that speed again, going 221. Yeah, about two knots fast. Once again, I've reduced power and we've increased our speed. <laughs> Got a sweaty manifold. I reckon I see it in the haze up ahead. 
So everything out here is flat as a pancake. Flat as flat can be. And I do see it up ahead. Unless that's a cloud, but I'm pretty sure it's right on our nose, so that's where we're going. And we're looking for a very large rock. And that's a very large rock. what it should look like. Yeah, that's definitely a big rock starting to hover out of the horizon there. that what's happening here out in Mount Augustus Tourist Park they have a uh, caravan park there with unit accommodation and camping grounds, hot showers that's much better than the Wolf Creek Crater one which had essentially nothing except running water <laughs> pets are welcome <laughs> That's a good place to camp. I like it. There's no air, airfields around to land on. I think the nearest um, airfield was the Lenor, um, the runway that we just turned at. There's a little dirt runway at the sheep station at Lenor. I believe that's actually the closest uh, runway to us, which is barely a runway. It's a, it's a dirt strip with nothing there. Privately owned land as well, so you'd need to request permission to uh, put an aeroplane there. Barely an improved airstrip, so you probably want fixed wing with the most rugged, rugged thing you possibly get there. Probably a Cessna 172 with uh, no wheel, wheel coverings on it. That'll get in and out, but uh, this plane probably not. <laughs> this one's a bit delicate with the retractable uh, undercarriage and the uh, approach speed of about 95 knots and a V ref of about 80. Yeah, wouldn't want to land this thing there. And the low wing as well, you'd be kicking up all kinds of rocks and dirt into your wing, into the flaps. So keep this aircraft away from those dirt strips and uh, if we do go a dirt strip we'll probably take the 172 down. 11. We have 7 minutes to the rock. Now we have been consistently too fast. So we'll probably get there a little early. I also put the waypoint right on top of the rock so probably want to turn before we get there on this side of the rock as well. I specifically just threw the uh, waypoint right on about there. But it's pretty obvious, that's the rock. Welcome to Barangara or Mount Augustus.
Continuing the stock bit, g'day. Human factors. Good stuff. Speaking of that, just gonna look at our fuel. Got plenty of it. Nearly over 50. 50 gallons of fuel on. This thing only burns 10 per hour. Only about an hour away from Carnarvon. I'm just going to move our heading bug ever so slightly over this side. We've got 10 minutes. We'll do a, a couple of orbits around our rock. 8 kilometers from one end to the other. It's a little less weather than Uluru. Still a bit more dirt on the thing. Not quite as sharp as Uluru. But they were both formed pretty much the same way. For the same reason that Uluru exists, this thing exists for the same essential reason. Ah, apparently there's a uh, 787 flying over the top. Meanwhile our map is centered over the wrong place. Jetstar 107, 787 heading from uh, Bali down to Perth. That's us right here. There's the rock right there. There's a little cloud formed on top of it. That's like a little, tiny little itty bitty lenticular cloud that hasn't had the chance to actually form. Time 15. We got there a lot earlier than I expected. Here are these uh, dirt tracks that come out, and I reckon that loop, there it is. There's the caravan park right there. Got it. You can even see the little uh, campsites around it. Cool, let's do a lap. Uh, before we do the lap, I'm just going to pick up a direct two. Direct two, Carnarvon. Sorted, so I don't need to worry about our heading or anything like that. And my aircraft. In fact, I'm going to slow it down quite a bit. Now fall down to 15. Lots of dirt roads out this way, there's not much tar seal to be seen. Probably want to be driving four-wheel drives in the dry season to get out to places like this.
I imagine the roads are pretty rugged and they'll get corrugate, uh, corrugations on them as well because you know, a lot of vehicles with the same kind of suspension drive along the roads you tend to bounce at the same point and you dig into the road and all, all the cars do that especially for all drives that are a little bit high on the road they essentially dig out the road into these little what they call corrugations so you're all bouncing along up and down, up and down much more comfortable in an aeroplane that's the upside much more comfortable, much more quicker in an aeroplane much more cooler apart from the air conditioning and the downside is you can't really stop you can't exactly go and visit that caravan park in our aeroplane because there's no runway I reckon an entire extra lap. Oh, sorry, move on from here. Those uh, caravan parks are just over there. Up in here somewhere. That road gets a bit close. Right, we'll brief our exit strategy. Uh, once we come around the other loop, we'll uh, chuck the other part back in, put ourselves on a westerly heading, and then uh, join the magenta line, do another direct to Carnarvon, pick up the time, accelerate uh, to uh, 22 on the manifold pressure, maintaining uh, 6,500, and uh, then we'll make our estimate entry. Next position is uh, Cobra Road, like the snake, Cobra. A Cobra. Dairy Creek Road. That'll be our next waypoint outbound. Just eight minutes if we're at 220 knots. So uh, once we pass the beam, the rock, the edge of the rock, the far end, eight kilometers away. 
should be at 220 knots. So I'll come around this end nice and slow. There's the little township of uh, Barangara, Barangara. That's an Aborigine settlement. Used to be an Aborigine mission. I'm sure a lot of bad things happened there in the past. Fortunately, most of the Aborigines now own their own towns under the Aborigine Corporation Agreement. Instead of having white people steal all their children away into a church in Borders Hill. See the four crossroads coming into that one little town. Okay, we're going to uh, just pass the rock so we have a clear shot to the west. I'll pour the gas on and start accelerating away. Climb again. Yeah, a little lake, look at that. Let's get north of this road here and then we'll uh, turn it west and go. Uh, you can see a couple of other rocks in the distance there, uh, a little bit like the relationship between Ayers Rock and Kudajara. Alright, let's get back into the cruise configuration, up to uh, 22. And that interest, all apart, is in. I'll let it start doing the trimming for us. Got to pick up a direct two. Give it to the nav. Gun it for a little while. Two twenty knots that we're looking for. Current time is twenty seven. Call it uh, thirty three. Eight minutes on, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen, fourteen, fifteen, twenty, thirty five. Cool. It's given us uh, two hundred and fourteen knots currently. It's suggesting two oh four. Gonna pick up the speed on this uh, uh, two hundred and twenty five.
10 knots on the uh, headwind there. Actually 10, not 19. Fix that up, still 8. It's 8. 27 plus 8. Yeah, 35. All good. What speed does it reckon we'll be doing in ground speed? 219. Perfect. Brilliant. Let's leave it there. To the knot. Okay, resumed on to Carnarvon. Next stop is the Cobra Dairy uh, Cobra Dairy Creek Road, which I call Cobra. Two hundred and nineteen knots, which is perfection. Distances aren't too bad. So, I kind of hastily threw this together, I'm not sure what the Cobra Dairy Creek Road is. Let's have a look. So Cobra Station is a pastoral lease, a sheep station. Property follows the Thomas River and has a snake-like shape giving rise to its unusual name, Cobra. Homestead at Cobra Station is also the Bangamol Inn, which was built in 1896 as a hotel. So essentially the uh, Cobra Station is uh, a small tourist attraction. It's a massive hotel with nearly four rooms in it. Awesome. <laughs> 
two minutes out and we should see the road. There's the road. Cobra Dairy Creek Road. Well, it's wonderful to see yourself two minutes out for your waypoint, which is a road, and there it is. Yeah, the next one is 14 minutes out. That's only time 49. So the next one is the crossing of the Lyons River and there is a road that runs along the side of the river so we should see a road with a dry river next to it. And there's the uh, Cobra Dairy Creek Road heading down towards Dairy Creek which is behind us and that's Cobra right there. You can see the river doing its old snaky thing. Snaking around and back. if that's a homestead right there. Regardless, that is definitely the, the Snaky River that gives the uh, Cobra Station its name. Alrighty. The Lions River will be the next waypoint. Time 49. That one was pretty much on time at 35, might have been even one minute early, but let's double check our speed. 224, yeah, let's bring the speed back a little. Should be stuck at about 220. Cool, there's our destination on the west coast of Australia, Carnarvon. Carmen on up. Yeah, we've got real world weather. Uh, the actual physical time is offset by a couple of hours so that we get daytime instead of flying through night time. I'm not flying this kind of area night VFR because you can't see anything, there's no lights. So we're flying day VFR using VFR uh, checkpoints along the route. Fire a certain speed and heading and uh, you'll eventually get to William XB. So I've just passed Barangara, which is uh, the largest rock, single rock structure in Australia, which is larger than Uluru, which is also a large single rock structure. And now we head towards Carnarvon. So in a little while we're going to pass the uh, Lyons River. 
and the Lyons River is going to be heading southbound towards the Gascoigne River. At some point it does join the Gascoigne River at Gascoigne Junction. There's a small airfield down there. We're going to be fairly well north of that position. We're just making a beeline straight towards the Carnarvon. After the Lyons River we head down towards the Gascoigne itself and we'll eventually cross over the Gascoigne River, kind of obliquely, uh, some 17 minutes after the next point position. Might as well get the uh, calculator out and do that one as well. Zero 06. So we'll be arriving at uh, Carnarvon at about 17 minutes to 20 minutes past the hour because we do have to do a circuit and land at some point. Yeah, while well, we're setting up for that, we've got nine minutes. I'm going to go ahead and uh, pick up the uh, AWIS or this uh, interesting new thing at Carnarvon called a WAT IR, which I hope is an automated thing and not some person picking up a telephone. <laughs> automated weather information service, Carnarvon Airport, no data available. Automated weather information oh. service. Carnarvon Airport. No data available. Okay, never mind. Um, never had one of them before. <laughs> Carnarvon Information Weather Service. No information is available. Bye bye. So according to the briefing, we should have a uh, altimeter setting of about one zero one nine. Temperature of. 23 and 20. Uh, wind 170 at 14. So there's a runway 22. 17, 18, 19, 20, 21, 22. So that's a 50 degree offset. It's going to be to the south. You also have this shorter runway. directly south. Less of a crosswind but also not as long. And we need a backtrack on that one up landing so I'm not really keen on that. Let's go for 2-2 and we'll roll through them nice and easily and come off on Alpha. Elevation is 13 which is essentially nothing. And I'm going to set up that uh, QNH one zero one nine.
Lockdowns only affected me emotionally <laughs> and the fact that I wasn't in Sydney last week and didn't meet any of my friends and uh, didn't go to a concert, didn't go to an air show, didn't go to a conference, didn't go to a meet up with uh, flight centers, didn't go to, <laughs> didn't go to a footy game, didn't, uh, yeah. Things that I would have liked to have done. Well, at least I can say that I still have a job. A lot of people can't say that. Just going to check a chart, make sure we haven't moved over into a different location. I think we might have. There's Carnarvon, and it should be on 122.1. No need to actually talk to the uh, Melbourne Centre. We don't need anything from it. Just going to re-lean our uh, engine. Make sure we're still running efficiently. Or 15.62.63. Out there. Cool. All right, the final push to the sea. About a half an hour away. Hundred miles. on for the moment.
guess what time it is? It's time to see that road in that river. And over overhead the uh, Lyons River right now. Which is that body of uh, mud. <laughs> There's a Lyons River crossing. So that was time 49 on the dock. 49, next one will be 06. And next one is the Gascoigne River itself. Now the Gascoigne River, as I said, the upside down river, the longest river in Western Australia, completely dry at the moment. Apart from a couple of puddles like that. Got a little bit of footage here that I put together of some other people's thing. Um, I have flown in rain before. Not much of it, but on the east coast part and um, down towards Victoria. I think the first leg was in rain as well, actually, come to think of it. In fact, the very first flight of the Round Australia tour, Essendon to Mount Hotham, the very first scene is the Avatar standing in the rain. You had to walk out to Essendon Airfield and get in the whatever you were flying then. I think it was the VTAL. First one to see the ocean. <laughs> what I will do for the moment is show you a little bit of footage of the Gascoigne River, which we're going to see in about seven minutes from now. Uh, this is taken um, during the wet season for the first. 30 seconds of the film and then you can see the same position the same location in the dry season now so here we have it water skiing in the Gascoigne River over the bridge or under the bridge wonderful big wide river full of water now this is the same bridge four months later and uh, these crazy guys are going not so water skiing sand skiing behind the four-wheel drive <laughs> being towed by a rope round and round yeah that's the same bridge the very same bridge that you saw in that first clip so that's the Gascoigne River as we will be seeing it today uh, about 8 months of the year it's just dry like that Yeah, a bit of extreme sport. Can't go skiing on the river, but you can always go skiing on the sand. <laughs> so there's the uh, river itself. You can see the. Uh, it's a very obvious river. It's just got no water in it most of the time. They say the water does seep into the ground underneath there. So there's a lot of bore water, which is why you can see all these crops growing. A lot of fruit trees around. So the bore water. They just draw the water, fresh water out of the, uh, the bore underground to uh, irrigate all the crops. Mostly banana trees and a few other fruit trees. But there's the river, pretty obvious. Big chunky brown thing. <laughs> well, fairly large depression in, into the ground completely surrounded by trees. It just gets dry because the rock is fairly porous. All the water kind of sinks straight through that. And um, all goes out to the sea. So that's the so-called river that we are going to be flying over in about 12 to 15 minutes from now.
fact, I think I see the river now. Yeah, maybe not. I'm seeing a little dark patch in the ground there. That's probably it. Yeah, well, the gas coin isn't exactly the Rubicon, is it? <laughs> so the little town of uh, Carnarvon, it's a uh, bit of a touristy town these days because it's on the beach people like coming up to the beach. Uh, the main industry is banana growing because of the uh, the bore water from the Gascoigne River which is underground. This is why they call it the Upside Down River because all the water is under the river <laughs> instead of off the top. So yeah, they uh, draw the water out of the bores and irrigate for the fruit farms, mostly uh, bananas, some of the fruits but mostly bananas. Uh, the other major industry here is uh, fishing and uh, crabs, oddly enough. Look at that wonderful intersection there. <laughs> right, I want to drive from here to here. Yeah, you have to stop here, do this massive turn here and then another one there. Yeah, more phone calls. Hello. <laughs> uh, Inspector, yeah, uh, probably doesn't need traffic lights. I don't. I doubt that easy section sees more than like three cars a day. So, apparently. <laughs> the major avatar here in Victoria, where we get most of our meat from, a um, bunch of coronavirus. Yeah, imagine being cop out here. Very interesting. <laughs> Not many people out here, to be fair. There's another road, look at that. <laughs> oh, 
Here we go. Great. Six minutes out, I reckon I can see the uh, our mystery river. There's actually some blue stuff at the bottom of that. That's not very realistic. Okay. This suggests that we'll be arriving at uh, Carnarvon at about time 1.5. I think we suggest that it's going to be 1.7. What's our speed? 2.17. Yeah, we're going a bit quicker. Ah, the wind. So just checking, after the gas going, we should have an increasing headwind. Not sure that's showing up. According to the forecast, it was uh, going to swing in to us and uh, increase the 20 knots. That one's about here, so it should be at uh, 280 at 20 knots. We've only got 6 knots. It was assuming 19 knots. Looks like our uh, forecast was slightly off there. What's current time UTC 10 one zero. Ah, that's an older older forecast, maybe that's why. Get the other forecast ready. Here, two, yeah, six knots, ten knots, two six zero at ten. That's if we call it six knots. Actual speed we're doing is about 320. Six spots, five at 11. Kind of mala. I've really lived out in the outback, certainly not in Queensland, and I've never set foot on Western Australian soil. Flown over it once, but actually, did I fly over it? Yeah, I must have. Come out of Kalumpa. Um, Probably just nicked the top of. Um, Top of the Kimberley, or heading over to our Northern Territory. 
never actually stood on Western Australia. I should one day. The furthest west I've been is just outside of the uh, I call it Smoky Bay, which is uh, not far from Sejuna, South Australia. <laughs> Hide your stash. Thirty-eight, about ten minutes out. So, one of the interesting things about Carnarvon was in the 1960s, about 65, uh, NASA came to Carnarvon and uh, they did a bunch of test rocket firings out into the Indian Ocean and also out into the desert uh, just to check a few rocket things, rocket tests and they uh, fired rockets up to 120 kilometers high into suborbit which would eventually crash out into the desert somewhere <laughs> and the NASA teams would go out there and pick up the remains of destroyed rocket um. Uh, keep on back frequency for a bit. Anyhow, uh, the other thing that they did was a tracking station, a lot like you have at parks in New South Wales. They had a very large uh, radar dish thing that had uh, sent telemetry uh, down from Gemini, Apollo, that kind of stuff. So they actually had this kind of setup Satellite Earth Station Carnarvon. A big dish that picks up uh, signals from Gemini and eventually the Apollo rockets. Right, somewhere along the river. And we just passed the river itself. The river is now on our right hand side if we look over the nose there. River. <laughs> the Gascoigne. Far too much water in it. But yep, that's our waypoint. Six minutes past the hour and we have the river just passing underneath. Carnarvon straight ahead. We'll start our descent. Uh, time 1.5. We'll call it 1.7. It's 10 minutes out. That's radio tech. Keep monitoring the Unicom as well. Carnarvon traffic, X-ray tanker Zillow is a Lansdale Legacy at 6,500. We are 30 miles to the east of Carnarvon at 6,500 estimated circuit time 15. We'll be positioning for a uh, visual approach runway 22, traffic Carnarvon. Carnarvon traffic, X-ray tanker There's the Indian Ocean straight ahead. Makes a very easy to spot visual marker. I'm going to pull back our speed now. Getting a little bit rich on the mixture and we'll slide it on down. All the parts are.
and I'm not even pushing forward on the yoke or changing the trim. All I'm doing is just pulling back on the manifold pressure. Gives it less power to the prop. And we start descending because the aircraft's already trimmed for 200 knots. Up here we see a very distinctive feature. You see the dregs of this dry river starting to hit the uh, estuary. So it becomes a saltwater river down there. Tidal river. Sean and Ralph find a jabber all over. Where is that place you said again? Somewhere in Queensland? Get the name of it. <laughs> yeah, sounds like fun. Having access to a small aeroplane. And you're living out in the middle of uh, nowhere. Are and there crocs? <laughs> <laughs> there probably are. The kilos on a short final runway 22, number two behind the Actually, we are subtropical. Uh, so we're actually, um, yeah, south of tropics. The Tropic Capricorn as well to our north. Yankee Mike Alpha is on a long final runway 22, number 3. And apparently that is a bit of a tourist beachy town, so maybe we're not in croc territory at the moment. We've left the sharks to our north, uh, left the crocodiles to our north, and now we're in shark territory instead of the croc territory. <laughs> Sharks and bottle brushes and blue ringed octopuses and all that kind of fun. Satellite dish site is some way south of Carnarvon itself, so I think it's somewhere in this sector. In fact, I'd say that is one of those uh, old rocket launch sites right there. There is an air and space museum in Carnarvon where they have uh, old replica ro rockets. I'm not even sure it's a regular. Uh, it might actually be a real rocket that was either not launched or launched and recovered. But yeah, there's a very nice museum down there. Hi there, Tim. Good to see you finish your uh, second mentoring session. I hope you, it's going well and we'll soon see you controlling. In a couple of weeks I'll need a controller at Jandicott airfield on one of these. Gonna call the manifold down to about 10. I'll leave it close enough. Now that bridge should be around about here. Just recognising all of these uh, these fields here. Carnarvon traffic, uh, Bonanza, Tango Delta Kilo, vacated on 36, vacating 36 and Bravo, Carnarvon traffic. There it is. There's that bridge we were uh, seeing on the video where those guys were Canarvon. pulling their the ski equipment no, underneath it. Yankee Mike Alpha is on short final. Come on, traffic, uh, Bonanza Tango Delta Kilo, take it as a proper. We have a traffic, x ray Tango Zulu is 8 miles uh, to the east. Positioning uh, to join a base runway 22. Try to up. I'm just 
widen this out a little bit so I can join the proper base. Actually, we might. Mm. Yeah, we'll join the base. Straight in on the base like that. Thinking we could go to the dead side and do an entire circuit, but nah. <laughs> Manifold at 10. Let's go and pop a little bit of the brakes. A couple minutes. Watch the speed wash away. Get it down about uh, 130 knots. Okay, prop RPM coming up full. Mixture is fully rich. And 1,500. Mixture fully rich. Prop fully forward. Fuel pump is set. And we don't have the landing gear down yet, so I'll get that sorted in a second. There's our speed gear coming. Brakes off. Brakes are released and undercarriage is down. Pop some uh, flaps now. Driver Carnarvon, uh, extra thank you to Zulus, uh, turning a left base, runway 22. Speed up to around 100. Traffic Canalburn, Yankee Mike Alpha is clear of one way TT. About there. Traffic Carnarvon, X-Ray Sanger Zulu, final runway 22. Four flaps out. <laughs> On Pappy, that's not a Vasi, that's a Pappy. Should be all white. Back on side, a little higher. It's one of you guys. Yes, it is. <laughs> Strangely nose down attitude off in the grass. Driver traffic, X ray Tango Zulu has a vacated runway 22. Traffic Carnarvon, Yankee Mike Alpha is clear 
as to the clubs. We're in this section over here. Oh, there's some civilization. I'm seeing a bunch of cars and stuff over there. We're in the kind of town that you might even be able to pick up an Uber. Just get them to take you to the nearest hotel, motel, fish and chip shop, Maccas, that kind of stuff. There's a fuel bowser. I don't know what this brick structure is all about, but anyhow. Traffic. Park and break your set. Okay, 1000 RPM. Boost pump is off, master AVX are off. Let's drop it. Open canopy. Let's have a closer look at this thing. Oh yeah, it is a fuel bowser. It's a bit of a small one. In fact, it's a bit of a... <laughs> it's an excessively small one. It's got a very large uh, fire extinguisher there. But yeah, that's fuel. Any place you can get some fuel from. Alrighty, here we are on the west coast of Australia. I've spent enough time in the desert. Uh, the next flights that we do will be down to a little place called Calberry. Uh, we're going to be flying over a place called Shark Bay. Useless Loop. We'll also be visiting the far, the furthest west point on the Australian mainland continent on the next flight. And after that we'll be heading back a little bit inland towards uh, some one last mining site before we head down to Perth. So it won't be Friday night because on Friday night we have a special Tasmania event going on. So it might be Sunday we do that. Sunday down to Calberry and then off into the mining site for next week, Wednesday the 13th. We'll see what happens after that. Um, that said, I don't want to stick with this aircraft for the moment because this aircraft is a very fast aircraft which is really good for these big long desert sectors over the middle of nowhere but the airports are getting a little bit closer together as we head towards Perth so I'm thinking we might be taking out the Cessna 172 on Sunday might make a poll about it 172, Piper, Arch Cherokee um, or maybe you have some other suggestions if you do leave a comment if you have a, a certain airplane that you'd really like to see fly and it's a, like a six, six seater, four seater, two seater something in that kind of range 
let me know and I'll see what I can do. Anyhow, that has been a flight over Barangara, the largest rock in Australia. <laughs> and uh, the Gascoyne River, the longest river in Western Australia, even though it doesn't have water in it most of the time. To the little township of uh, Carnarvon, which has a big space radar. How about that? Ah, Kevin Morris is uh, talking about Cessna 210. Other people wanted to fly around uh, 172. Yeah, cool. I'll see what Cessna 210s exist out there. It seems to be a reasonable one. Someone wants to see me fly a tail dragger. Hmm. Hmm. <laughs> Those are weird. I don't like tail draggers. Tricycle gear all the way, man. Anyhow, that has been us in Carnarvon. Wonderful little beach town over there. First time I've seen some proper civilization. This town has a, a population of 6,000 people. It's the biggest place we've been in since Broome. So yeah, it'll be fun. Down the Calberry mm, on Sunday via the westernmost point of the Australian mainland. Catch you then. Ciao for now.